All right. Well, um, it's about one after, and I promised I would get started promptly. So uh, welcome, everybody, to Machine Metrics webinar series, The State of the Industry, Impact of COVID-19 on the Economy. We are super psyched to have everybody here today. Uh, over 200 people on live, over 500 registrants. Uh, the series is really, you know, uh, even our surprise, uh, gotten a lot of attention and excitement, and we're, we're so glad to have you here today. Uh, a bit of an, uh, a welcome and an introduction. Uh, the, the coronavirus outbreak has caused widespread concern and economic hardship for, uh, for consumers, businesses, and, and communities around the world. Uh, the fact is that the situation is, is moving quickly and has widespread impacts. But one thing is for certain, it has and will continue to have global economic and financial ramifications that will be felt and reverberated throughout the manufacturing community. So the question, how, does, how has COVID-19 affected the near-term global manufacturing economy? How will it be affected moving forward? Uh, how, how do we reshape and build an industry both more sustainable and, and resilient for the future? In times like these, it's never been more important to harness the power of data to inform us of what's happening, and more importantly, what we can do to help protect the lives and the livelihoods of communities and industries around the world. Um, in our fourth State of the Industry panel, we'll be exploring these issues using a variety of unique data sets to illustrate the economic impact of COVID-19 uh, pandemic on our world. For those of you who's, who've come to our previous events, uh, you, you probably know me by now. Uh, my name is Graham Immerman, VP of Marketing at Machine Metrics, and I will be your host and moderator today. Uh, but far more exciting than me, we have an amazing group of panelists that I'd like to introduce now. Uh, first, we have Chad Moutre, he's Chief Economist, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers. Chad, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, uh, we also have Jerry Foster, who's the Chief Technology Officer at uh, Plex Systems. Jerry, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. And from uh, the machine metrics side, we have Lou Zhang, who's our Chief Data Scientist uh, for Machine Metrics. Lou, thanks for being here. Great to be here, Graham. So a quick review uh, of our agenda. We're gonna do a brief introduction, followed by company presentations, and then we'll have a live discussion as well as a Q&A um, and, and talk about what's, what's coming next. Before we get started, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, fear not, uh, we will send out a link with the recording after this webinar uh, in an email, uh, usually within the next 24 hours, but don't hold us to anything. Uh, we'll do our best. Uh, questions are, are not only welcome, but are encouraged. Please use the Zoom Q&A section in the navigation to ask a question at any time to our panel and panelists. We will do our absolute best to get to those as, as quickly as we can. Uh, but um, but uh, we also have a number of other questions and we expect a lot of them. So uh, do not be shy. Um, a, a look into the future quickly on July 8th uh, from 12 to one, we will be hosting the next, uh, a next, uh, webinar in our webinar series, Preparing for the Bump, with our friends at Mastercam, where we'll be exploring uh, the inevitable uh, bump that will come after this dip in, in productivity and how to make sure that your company is set up uh, to be one of those winners uh, when that time comes. Again, this will be on July 8th uh, at uh, 12 to 1, and there is a landing page live on the Machine Metrics website that you can get, um, you, you can sign up today. Uh, at this critical time, uh, we are also happy to continue offering our support to all manufacturers and, ma and manufacturing efforts contributing to the fight against COVID-19. Uh, we're offering free access uh, to the Machine Metrics platform and our consulting services uh, uh, to any company involved with the production of ventilator parts, test equipment, protective equipment, or any COVID-related manufacturing support. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about our response program, please visit www.machinemetrics.com slash covid dash 19 dash response. Okay, as promised, uh, for those of you that, that don't know us, uh, I'm here just to provide a little bit of background and then we're gonna get to the, uh, the reason why you're all here today. Uh, uh, machine Metrics, we are manufacturing's industrial IoT platform for machines. 
Uh, Machine Metrics is accelerating industrial digital transformation by providing an intuitive and flexible platform to easily collect data from any piece of manufacturing equipment uh, and transform that data into powerful, actionable applications that reduce your machine downtime, uh, optimize your capacity utilization of your equipment, and drive increased throughput and profitability for factories. Uh, right now, uh, hundreds of manufacturers have connected thousands of machines uh, to the Machine Metrics plas platform ac across global factories. Uh, our platform is very focused on enabling companies to harness the power of their machine data to drive immediate actionability through real-time visibility into production, uh, historical reporting and bottleneck identification, predictive tooling and maintenance applications, uh, customizable uh, rules-based workflows for any shop floor data item, and text email notifications that deliver optimized processes to factory workers. Build your own apps uh, or seamlessly connect with your current shop floor systems uh, and easily integrate uh, machine data across your digital factory. With machine metrics, uh, manufacturers can now significantly expedite their time to value for Industry 4.0 implementations by putting their machine data to work immediately and provide the foundation for, for scaling industrial IoT and Industry 4.0 across their operations while prioritizing their internal resources towards their own competencies. Now, enough about me uh, and enough about us. We're gonna pass the mic to our chief data scientist, Lu Zhang, who's gonna give us uh, the first of what will be three data-driven presentations. Uh, Lu, the floor is yours. Uh, we're excited. All right, thank you for the introduction, Graham. Uh, as uh, he said, my name is Lu. I'm the chief data scientist here at Machine Metrics. Uh, so today I'm gonna be presenting a bit about what our data is showing about the impact of COVID on the economy. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And, you know, before I get started with the actual insights themselves, uh, I really want to explain how we actually get all this data. I think it's really important because what we're doing here is something that's um, fairly novel and it um, hasn't really been done uh, widely throughout the industry yet. So what you're seeing here is the inside of a of a machine tool, uh, basically the, the control of a machine tool. Um, so, um, you know, you have these circuits and what we do is we come in with uh, two things, an edge device in green here and an IO device here. And we plug into the programmable logic control of the machine. Um, through these connections, we get all the data we need to monitor machines uh, and also to do some other cool things like predictive analytics. Um, so uh, over the past couple of years, we've spent a very large uh, portion of our time uh, developing this sort of plug and play architecture. Um, we realized that this was actually the, the right way to go about things because uh, people don't want to spend you know, months uh, or even weeks uh, figuring out how to connect their machines. Um, so we've built these proprietary C++ adapters to easily get data off of the control of the machine uh, directly. And so this is what our customers see. Um, you know, they can see these nice dashboards where they can see their utilization, their machines are on or off, uh, how many parts they've made, uh, if they're at their parts goal, uh, all sorts of great things. And uh, this, is, this is really what, what our main business is. Um, but if you think about it, we've been doing this for over five years. So we have over, uh, you know, a billion parts that we've tracked at this point. Um, we've, uh, we're currently tracking over a billion dollars worth of capital equipment and each dot on this map represents um, a individual customer that we have. So we have you know, hundreds of customers with thousands of different machines and one of the questions that I often get when I'm speaking to people is what is your exact sample size? Well oftentimes we, we actually don't know because we work through distributors and we work through OEMs and uh, you know people self-install our products and it, sometimes our, our product is even self-propagating. So, you know, we don't know exactly how many machine metrics um, uh, licenses are out in the field at any one time. Um, you know, we can, uh, we can kind of guess uh, or, or we can kind of look, but really all we can confidently say at this point is it's thousands of different uh, machines across hundreds of different companies in the US. Um, so what does this give us? So what we can see here is just a simple seven-day moving average of, of utilization. 
um, across 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, some of the things you might immediately notice are that there are certain trends in here that are evident across every single year. For example, uh, there's a dip in Easter uh, in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, Easter obviously occurs at different Sundays uh, in, in every year, so they occur at different times every year. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see, you know, broader trends and um, some interesting insights out of this. Uh, but before we get into that, um, I really want to take a pause and do some due diligence here. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is because um, our insights and our numbers have really started to get picked up by various different organizations um, who are actually using it for their forecasts and for their economic analysis. Um, so I feel like it's really important to kind of clarify some of the definitions that we have. So first of all, what is utilization? So when we go onto a machine tool, uh, we can see all sorts of things that the control is uh, giving us. So we can see when a G-code program is running, we can see when the control is sending an active state, and for older machines like this, where we might not be able to get directly to the control, we can just attach a current transducer to one of the wires and track when there is electricity flowing. And utilization is when any of these three, uh, I guess, conditions are, are true. Um, so um, just to get that definition out of the way. And then second, um, some of you, especially from an economics background, might be more familiar with uh, the Federal Reserve's capital utilization uh, metric. Um, and cap util uh, is typically you know, around 60, 70, 80%. Um, and this is actually because of a difference in definition. Uh, cap util is defined as the portion of utilized capacity as a percentage of sustainable maximum output. Um, so sustainable maximum output is actually um, quite uh, I guess, subjective, and it's left to every single factory owner to decide what that actually is. Uh, so it considers things like limits to human work effort. So that 60%, 70% utilization that, that you see from the Fed, uh, that might only be on an 80 hour week. Um, but since we're attached all the time and we can monitor machines all the time, uh, we assume 160 hour weeks on our machines. So when you see 30% utilization, it means that literally eight hours out of the day, uh, that machine is being used. And then lastly, what portion of manufacturing are we actually tracking here? So the vast majority of our software is on machines that manufacture durable goods. Durable goods are goods that last longer than three years. So things like automotive components, um, you know, uh, medical devices. It's not things like paper towels, um, you know, solo cups, things like that. And 90 to, 90 to 95% of durable good manufacturing is done by machine tools. We call this discrete manufacturing. And 50% or 56% of overall manufacturing is of durable goods. Now, one of the interesting things here is that durable and non-durable manufacturing often are very highly correlated with each other, uh, especially when you look over the long term. Um, so we actually don't think it's that big of a deal that we're only tracking this portion of the market, this half of the market, because um, oftentimes, you know, if uh, people aren't using as as many uh, cars they're not gonna need the non-durable goods that come with that too. Um, so things like um, perhaps cleaning products for those cars. So let's move on to the good stuff. Um, so let's just look at 2020 here and what's been going on. But basically what we've seen over the last couple months is we see a 7% increase from the beginning of the year until the coronavirus really hits the US. And then we see about a 16% decrease from mid-March to mid-April and then an 8% recovery from mid-April until present. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that and think about why these little bumps are occurring in the way they are. So let's, uh, let's call this the good times from mid-January to mid-March. What happened here? So on January 15th, the US and China signed a phase one trade deal. And what we saw in our customer base is that this resulted in a stronger than usual uh, post-holiday bump in utilization. Um, so, you know, you kind of see the higher slope here and you really see manufacturing taking off in the beginning of the year. Um, on February 7th, you know, we're aware that coronavirus is uh, hitting the Far East and we're so confident that it's not going to get to us that we sent 18 tons of PPE over to China. Um, our customers internally are reporting increased orders due to Chinese factory shutdowns. 
causing this uh, sort of acceleration in the utilization that you see here. On February 15th, we hit a eight month high in US domestic utilization of about 29%. And simultaneously on that day, the, double, the, the World Health Organization says that they're concerned by the lack of urgency in funding the response from the international community. So this is very important to, uh, to remember here. I'm gonna to return to this point later. And on March 11th, unfortunately, um, you know, we can't hide forever from, from pandemics. Uh, a global pandemic is declared officially by the WHO and US domestic utilization immediately reverses direction. So now we get to the bad times. What's going on here? On March 16th, cases outside of China outnumber cases inside of China. We see in our customer base that shutdowns really start to begin in force. On March 19th, there's a severe shortage of PPE reported by the New York Times. And we see our customers continue to shut down, continue to slow down because they can't operate uh, without this protective equipment. On April 1st, this is really the height of the actual pandemic itself. There's a weekly doubling of global cases. Um, some of our customers actually retool to help make ventilators, accounting for this you know, slowdown uh, of, uh, of um, decrease a little bit. But as we all know, that can't last forever. By April 15th, uh, 40 states have declared stay-at-home orders and paired with the Easter holiday, uh, US domestic utilization really hits a low point of about 21% which is a substantial decrease from the 29% that we discussed earlier. So where, what regime are we in now? So from mid-April uh, until present, there are some really interesting things going on. So, you know, overall there's an upward trend, uh, but there's, uh, there's a lot more to this. So on April 16th, the Trump administration re reveals a reopening plan and you know, our, our customers, what we see is they, they start to begin staggered shifts, which means they're not operating at full capacity, but they might, um, you know, start having some machines on that weren't on before. Um, on May 1st, uh, the World Economic Forum officially recognizes that there are severe supply chain disruptions. Raw materials um, and consumer markets are garbled at this point. Um, just like you can't get your beef from Wendy's anymore, our customers couldn't get their um, you know, raw bar stocks uh, from whatever source they were getting them from before as well. And uh, demand has also collapsed on the other side. So it's, it's an uneven recovery. You know, it's, it's not like it's, it's just gonna reopen and, and we're gonna take off. Um, on May 25th, the dip you see here is Memorial Day. Uh, customers on that day have about 3% utilization on average. Um, and I wanted to put this here because it really demonstrates the effect of just one day on uh, rolling utilization. Um, you know, that's what this dip is coming from right here. And on June 21st, um, you know, just a couple days ago, 90% uh, of states are now basically reopen. Uh, they allow uh, businesses to do uh, uh, basically personal care businesses like spas and salons, uh, retail malls, uh, restaurants and bars. Uh, for the mass, vast majority of the country, um, this is, uh, the economy has essentially started to reopen at this point. And really what we see in our customer base is about half the utilization lost during the pandemic is recovered at this point. So this was really interesting to look at, but what's more interesting to look at is perhaps some breakdowns of our data. Uh, so remember, for every single one of the machines that we're attached to, we know what location it's in. Um, and so we can do a regional breakdown and we do see regional variations. You know, we can overanalyze this all we want, but I really wanna point out two things here. The first is that, as we all anecdotally know, uh, shutdowns of the Northeast are the longest and most strictly enforced. Uh, we see that in our customer base. Our customers in Massachusetts, New York, um, really see hard shutdowns and, and reductions. Uh, there's um, less flexibility about what an essential business actually is. Um, longer shutdowns, and that's reflected in this, uh, this uh, very steep decrease in utilization that continues uh, really through the beginning of May. And then secondly, in our current uh, state, what we can, or in our current you know, time state, what, what we can see is that Southern and Midwestern states are really leading uh, this increase in utilization. 
Um, when we talk to our customers in Tennessee, Florida, Texas, uh, they're all seeing very strong reopenings. And that's what you see with this um, very strong acceleration and upward slope in the South and, and the Midwest. In the Northeast and the West, um, you know, we're being a little more cautious here, and that's reflected in the, in the data itself. So what if we break this down by industry? Um, so for this, we reached out to our friends at AMT. You know, it's not as clear cut exactly what industry each one of our customers is in. Um, so we, we reached out to subject matter experts there. And you know, we, we have a pretty good uh, idea of what distribution our customers fall into. Um, so we're um, slightly underrepresented in automotive, and we're slightly overrepresented in medical devices uh, as compared to manufacturing as a whole. So that's just something uh, good to keep in mind as we look at the data. So again, we could overanalyze this all we want, but two things I really want to point out here are that automotive collapses uh, by about 40%. Uh, I read somewhere that demand for cars has gone down by something like 90 or 95% in the US. And this is reflected all the way through the supply chain. And then secondly, we actually see a slight increase of medical device manufacturing throughout the pandemic. Now, this makes sense because things like, you know, ventilators, um, you know, medical supplies, things that hospitals need, um, as they get frequented or as they have more and more people, they're going to need more and more supplies. They consume more and more of these you know, raw devices. And um, medical used to be, you know, second, third place uh, in our industry um, rank. But by now, uh, it's really risen resoundingly to first place. And I think this is just a very clear reflection of, of the times. So why is this data useful? You know, you know, we can present all of these interesting things about our data, but what actual utility does it have? So what we've heard is that the most useful uh, use of this is that it actually anchors conversations in reality. So if we're showing a negative 17, 16% a decrease in utilization, but a VP of sales is uh, forecasting, you know, 50% decrease in in, utilize, in, uh, in sales, there's a disconnect there. Um, and so you can kind of, you know, check that with actual data. Um, we've talked to VC firms who say that when they go in and evaluate uh, machine shops to buy, um, oftentimes people claim 60, 70% utilization. But really when we show 30, 35, you know, 25% utilization, uh, that's a more realistic number. And when it's backed up, by our methodology and the way we actually collect this data. Uh, oftentimes that's um, a, a more rigorous approach to evaluating the actual utilization figure for the industry as a whole. The second use case is that um, it serves as an alternative source for economic benchmarking. Um, other sources of data are currently broken. Uh, the, New, the New York Times reported on this back in April. Um, so, you know, most of the indicators that, that you see, you know, Fed's indicators, uh, BLS, government indicators, they're based off of surveys. But business owners aren't going to be answering surveys in a, the middle of a pandemic. Uh, they probably have greater things to worry about. So these uh, sources of data are skewed. Um, they're broken. They're not getting released on time. And this is where we can come in and we can say, well, look, you know, we're an al alternative source of data. Um, it's not like we demand, uh, you know, questionnaires from our customers. All of this is collected automatically, regardless of uh, if they have time to answer surveys or not. Um, Forbes actually wrote an article about us back in early March. Um, so before the U.S. shut down, what was actually happening was that a lot of manufacturing from overseas was coming back. And they reported that this actually might be delivering a local manufacturing renaissance. Um, unfortunately, as we know, that doesn't last forever. Uh, eventually, the pandemic came to our shores and uh, shut everything down for us as well. And then the third use case, which I actually think is perhaps the most pertinent, is that it really allows automated high-frequency updates of economic indicators. So policymakers, uh, they can look at our data and they can say, what was the actual effect of shutting down um, you know, New York, Massachusetts, and of Vermont um, because we saw a spike in cases. And our customers, they will reflect that immediately. If there is policy that's being made that says that X type of business has to shut down, you know, we don't have to wait for surveys. 
we see that immediately in, in our customer base. And I think that's where the power of this data really is. As we go into the fall and as we go into next year before we actually have um, a vaccine, it's gonna be really important for us to be able to respond with agility to um, changes in both um, the, uh, the trajectory of this pandemic and also to policy decisions. Um, so one of the great advantages that we have over the 1918 pandemic is that we have these alternative sources of data. We have these high frequency updates. So we can say, what is the actual effect of policy? You know, and balancing health and economic outcomes is gonna be really critical uh, in the next couple of months. So that's all I have, and I'll hand it off to um, Chad for his presentation with Nam. Thank you very much. Yeah, Lou, thanks so much, Chad. Appreciate you taking the reins. And uh, I just do encourage all of you who are uh, attending, which is well over 200 on this Zoom, uh, to, um, uh, to ask any questions away uh, using the Q&A section. Chad, take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks. And thanks, Lou. That was fascinating. Um, so I, I, as I learn more about your data, I, I've certainly become impressed with all the data that's there. Uh, anyway, so I'm, I have a lot to go through. I'm going to have about 10 minutes to go through it. So I'm going to jump right into these slides. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. You see the at, at the bottom there at Chad Moutre if you're interested in following me there. Um, uh, but I'm going to start here. So we do a manufacturer's outlook survey once a quarter. And you see here the 22-year uh, history of that, of that overall survey. It's averaged uh, 74 and a half over that time frame. Uh, and you see here what's happening. Basically, we are really the weakest in terms of the survey that came out in June, the weakest since the Great Recession. Uh, and you can see even more fully when you kind of break out the last couple of years, just how much life has shifted in the last two years, right? So uh, in June of 2018, we had an all-time high. So uh, you have to pick a bucket. You're either positive or you're negative. So you, you, you have no neutral here, which gives you these kind of elevated numbers. But 95% of our members were positive in June 2018. <clears throat> and those numbers stayed relatively elevated up until you know uh, the beginning of 2019. Last year, we obviously had the trade war conversation, slowing global growth. Uh, things slowed down to roughly 68% positive. Uh, you, as, as Lou was mentioning earlier, you were starting to see some signs of stabilization uh, earlier in the year, especially in January and February uh, after you know, the USMCA got passed uh, and with the China deal and a bunch of other things, globally, you were starting to see a little bit better growth pre-COVID. Uh, and you can see what happened, obviously, uh, between uh, when we surveyed people in February and when we surveyed people in May, uh, what happened at 33.9%. Again, that is the lowest number we have seen really uh, since, since 2009. Now, uh, other surveys have also shown similar things, and this is where I get to actually be somewhat optimistic, right? Where you've started to see a number of data points uh, where we've bottomed out. Um, clearly, the recession began in February. I think we knew that even before the National Bureau of Economic Research kind of dictated that in the last week or so. Uh, but in my view, we've actually already passed the trough, right? We've already, so this could be, end up being one of the deepest uh, recessions we've ever had, but also one of the, one of the shortest, right? Um, and so you're starting to see signs of, of a little bit of a rebound. And this shows you the ISM data through May. Um, uh, and uh, you know, clearly we're still in contraction ter territory in May, but the, the rate of growth has slowed pretty, pretty dramatically. And you see, you're gonna see a lot of graphs that look exactly like this one. Um, and, and you see that in, in particular when you look at the overall manufacturing production data. Again, look, really two really bad months of declines, 5.3% manufacturing production decline in April, uh, uh, and then, excuse me, in, in March, and then 15.5% five, in April. Uh, and then you had a little bit of a rebound. Uh, uh, this number actually, when if you remember last week when it came out, there was a lot of hemming and hawing over, you know, we didn't in, rebound fast enough, right? The, the people were expecting a stronger rebound in the month of May. Uh, but I, I continue to expect those numbers to, to kind of come back uh, as you move into, into June, especially as more production comes online. Uh, and you see, again, when you look at the year-over-year -year growth rate numbers, uh, again, just how bad things got. Uh, certainly, if you're in the durable goods space, you had roughly a 28% year-over-year decline in April. That came back up a little bit to, to uh, roughly 23 to 24%. Uh, but still, those are significant declines. 
Now, I, I'm going to say all this to say, yes, we're seeing a rebound, uh, but there's also clearly a long way to go. Uh, in Washington, of course, uh, when we got the jobs numbers and we got some of the other data points that I'm, I'm talking about, there has been an emphasis from a lot of policymakers saying, well, we don't need to do anything, obviously, given that the economy is already on the, on the mend, right? It's already bouncing back. Uh, and, and it is true the economy is bouncing back, but, but this chart and some of the others will show you that we still have a long way to go, right? So this is showing you manufacturing production and capacity utilization really over the last uh, 12 years, I guess, in this case. Uh, you can see, obviously, we got below where we were in the Great Recession here in terms of some of these measures. Um, and we have a long way to go before we get back uh, to where we were. In fact, I quoted in the press as saying, I don't think we'll be back to full our pre-recessionary levels of production until at least 2022. Right? So yes, we're coming back, but it's going to be more of a swoosh uh, shape of recovery rather than a V, which uh, is kind of becoming prominent. The other thing to note here is that even with the rebound we had in May, you have some sectors here. This is all 19 major sectors. Notice none of them. Uh, on a year-over-year -year basis are positive, right? They, they all are seeing declines on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, the worst obviously being motor vehicles. Again, most motor vehicle productions uh, sh shut down for, for several weeks at least uh, and are just now coming back online. So we're gonna continue to see growth there as, as, those, uh, as those factories continue to open up. Uh, but again, across the board here, some really significant kind of jaw-dropping levels of, of decline in manufacturing. Again, we're going to see greater data, you know, as, as you move into June, these are going to improve, but, but still a ways to go. Uh, turning globally, I, and I won't, I don't have enough time to go through all of this. I write a Monday economic report that many of you probably get. Uh, if you get the Monday, you get my global, which comes out once a month. This shows you the top 10 markets that we sell into. And every market except for China was, was contracting uh, in the month of May. Uh, we've seen some of the preliminary data that have come in, including this morning, are showing uh, some continued progress there. And so this is, this is a chart that I actually updated this morning. And so yeah, again, if you're following me on Twitter, you probably already saw this one. Uh, again, a little bit of a V-shape here. You're seeing some stabilization uh, in terms of some of the sentiment measures. Uh, and this one is for the US. Uh, and so adding in the June data, this is preliminary data, but you're seeing a similar level of stabilization uh, when you look at Europe, right? So again, numbers under 50 are contraction. Uh, you actually had France, uh, as well as the UK, which is not on this chart, uh, stabilize and move into expansion in the month of June. So again, a long way to go, but still some positive signs out there. Turning to employment, uh, this shows you, this, looks, this chart looks almost identical to the manufacturing production chart that I showed you earlier. This is showing you overall manufacturing employment. Uh, we were uh, roughly at 12.85 million workers in the manufacturing sector in February. That fell dramatically down to, you know, just a little above 11.4 million, 11.5, uh, I guess, uh, in, in April, excuse me, in May, and that's bounced it back up a little bit. Uh, we did get 225,000 uh, additional workers, as you saw in the most recent data point but we're still down 1.1 million workers in the sector. I do expect that to continue to move in the right direction over the coming months as more factories come back online. But again, this shows you the extent to which uh, that, that decline was, was, was pretty sharp. Uh, and then the next few charts are gonna show you again, just how big of a hole we're in, right? I guess so. This is showing you declines in the manufacturing sector since February. So this is including uh, the, the progress we made in May, but it shows you the extent to which we still have a long way to go. Uh, transportation, obviously, the, most of that decline is coming from motor vehicles, as we mentioned earlier. But you see here, almost every, se every sector has declines. Uh, even the sectors that have done fared better uh, have seen declines in employment uh, over that, that, that three-month time frame. Uh, in terms of the, the, on a state by state basis, uh, not shockingly, Michigan is at the top of the list here, given the motor vehicle challenges that are out there. California is up there largely because of its size. Um, but again, when you're looking at these states, these are heavily uh, manufacturing intensive states and, and not shocking that you're seeing some pretty dramatic declines up there in terms of manufacturing employment over that time frame. again, February to May. Uh, and then, if, again, if you're getting the Monday report, you got this as the graph this week. This is showing you the unemployment rates as of May. Uh, every one of these states had progress between April and May. In fact, the top one there, Nevada, 
had an unemployment rate of 30% in April and that fell to 25%, but those are jaw dropping numbers. Uh, 25 is great recession, great uh, depressionary uh, levels of unemployment. And it sh again, it shows you the extent to which, again, those, those are, Nevada's challenge is a little bit manufacturing, but mostly because it's heavily dependent on the service sector. Okay, now we turn to the outlook because I wanna make sure we have enough time for Jerry uh, Foster to, to speak. Uh, so we're gonna be getting a new number on Thursday for uh, first quarter GDP. So it's gonna be revised a second time. I don't expect it to be much different than the 5% number that we had uh, in, in the revision that came out last month. Uh, we are seeing a forecast of around negative 30% or so uh, for the second quarter. Uh, I wouldn't actually, this is me completely going off, off the cuff here. I wouldn't be shocked to see that number a little bit less than what we're calling, I mean, it's not less, more than, so better than the negative 30% number, but almost every forecaster, including myself, is, is, is showing a negative 30-ish handle for that. Uh, that would be the worst decline in, in GDP, uh, obviously, we've, we've ever seen, certainly since the Great uh, Depression. Uh, but it will be followed by uh, a huge rebound in the, in the third quarter. I have a roughly 18% increase uh, in GDP in the third quarter, roughly 4% uh, increase in the fourth quarter. Uh, the forecasts from economists for the fourth quarter are all over the place. Um, uh, some of them obviously think we might have a second wave in, in, in the second half of the year, and so I think that kind of plays into some of these forecasts. Uh, but I have a really relatively healthy 4% number up there. Uh, even with uh, this particular increases that we're going to be seeing in the second half of this year, I still have GDP falling 4.5% this year, a, a nice uh, healthy 3% next year. Uh, in terms of manufacturing production, again, uh, I noted I don't think we're going to get back to our pre-recessionary levels of output until 2022, uh, and, and, and you have a 6.6% decline is what I'm calling for right now in manufacturing production this year. Uh, and I did this chart early on, actually even before uh, we had the official recession uh, declared, but this kind of compares the current recession to the pr four previous ones, so since 1980. Uh, and you can see here GDP, obviously, we're way well off uh, any, any of our past precedents there with down 32.5% in, in the second quarter, if that's what we get. Uh, the previous high was 8.4% decline in the Great Recession. 14.7 uh, was what we had as far as the unemployment rate uh, in April. Uh, that uh, surpasses the 10.8% we had um, in, in early 1980. Uh, three, excuse me, in the end of 1983. Uh, the one point, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, we, we, I, we lost basically one and a half million workers uh, in the month of April so far. We're, we're down roughly 1.1 still off of that. Uh, so, so uh, you know, that clearly is, is, is not as, wor as bad as we had in the Great Recession, but, but certainly marks up there with, with some pretty dramatic declines. Most of the declines in unemployment actually have come on the service side. Uh, and manufacturing production, that's, we're certainly at levels now at, which rival uh, what we were seeing in the Great Recession. So um, I say all that to say, yes, we, we have, we were making progress. I do think we're going to continue to make some strong gains as we move into the second half of the year. Uh, but it's also important to note there's still risk to that forecast. Um, certainly, uh, if we have a second wave, uh, there's obviously political risks with the election coming up. Uh, and and you know, we obviously dug ourselves in a hole, and we still have a long way to go. Um, that was encouraging, right? I don't know. Was that encouraging? I don't, uh, yes, it's it's I, I, I the glass half full. Uh, but but even even I can't uh, gloss over a, a minus a twenty percent uh, GDP over three three straight months. There. So I mean, oh, excuse well, me. In, no, th in industrial production, sorry. Chad, that was amazing, and, and you know, and the, the thing is, uh, you know, the, the data doesn't lie, right? There's there's no manipulation. It's just it's just the the cold hard numbers. Uh, but I think that uh, you know, part of this, right, in this webinar is 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 driving people towards what they can do with that data, right? And I think uh, by democratizing it, making it available, right, uh, you can uh, you can transform that into opportunity um, and and, uh, and 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 value, right? Uh, so thank you so much. That was amazing. And a quick note before I introduce Jerry. Um, obviously, each of these presenters could probably spend at least an hour uh, doing their own presentations. Um, you know, so with that said, um, uh, no pressure to our presenters, uh, but Lou and I uh, will be able to stay a few months, a few minutes over, um, you know, well, to answer some, some questions. Um, but um, for now, let's pass the mic to Jerry. 
and, and thank you so much uh, for joining us. Excited for your presentation. Thanks so much, Graham. I, I'm privileged to be in the, the company of such esteemed and, and well-groomed panelists. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. So um, I'm going to uh, share my screen. All right, is that good? Can we see that? All right, so um, uh, as you've heard, my name is Jerry Foster. I'm the CTO and co-founder of, of Plex Systems. Um, I've been involved in, in manufacturing my entire career, 30 years. Um, I love exploring the intersection of, of, of manufacturing and technology. And I'm, I'm real passionate about, about leadership and culture and in, empowering uh, employees and, and, and making sure that they're the best that they can be. Uh, in their workplace. Um, so who's Plex? You might not be familiar with Plex. You might not have heard of us before. So um, at Plex, we make hair growth tonic for middle-aged men. Uh, we're very successful at it. No, I'm just kidding. We don't do that at all. Um, so what we do do is um, make manufacturing systems, manufacturing software. Um, we've uh, built the Plex smart manufacturing platform, and we are 100% manufacturing. Basically, we provide a, a integrated set of uh, software products uh, along the lines of ERP, and MES, IoT, and supply chain management, uh, working in conjunction with each other or separately or with your other best of breed product in order to bring efficiency to your manufacturing floor. Uh, we have been in the cloud, true multi-tenant SaaS uh, from uh, 2001. So we're one of the first enterprise software companies uh, in the world to bring our software to the cloud uh, and uh, built it from the ground up. And uh, four nines uptime, very successful at that. And so this is not something new for us. We've been doing this for a very long time, uh, running manufacturing in the cloud. And our customers are uh, very pleased. We have a great rapport with our customers, a very high renewal rate. I uh, really enjoy working with them. Uh, the pictures here actually show uh, a few pictures of Plex running in various scenarios. Uh, uh, Plex can run in just about any sort of environment with any sort of device, tablets, uh, PC, mobile. Um, this isn't a stock photo on the bottom. This is actually one of our customers running Plex on Google Glass. So uh, we uh, love the um, capabilities that the cloud provides us to deliver Plex in many different environments. We've got 670 customers uh, in 29 countries, uh, recording about 8 billion transactions every single day. And a transaction in this case would be uh, any um, a piece of work, like uh, creating a production record or adding a PO or making a shipment. Each of those is a transaction. So we are recording a huge amount of data uh, every day at our 2,000 facilities around the world. Uh, and since we are cloud-based, uh, we have access to all that data to aggregate and anonymize that and come up with some really interesting insights. Um, I'll skip the NASCAR slide uh, for the sake of time. So when, when COVID uh, really started to become an issue for us in March, we, we started thinking, what, what is it that we should be doing? And our CEO, Bill, uh, he had him on the left. He called, he called, it was March 15, and he called me and he said, Jer, how can we look so much alike? And I said, well, that's not important now. But what is important is how, how, how should we be responding to this crisis that we are witnessing right in front of us, unfold right in front of us around the world. We had a number of uh, our customers that had started to pivot and were doing things like uh, um, uh, helping build ventilators, uh, face masks and face guards and, and uh, sanitizer. And um, so we were thinking, you know, what can we do to help uh, through this crisis. And we're not a manufacturer, but we're software and we're in the cloud. So we have access to a huge amount of data. And this data comes in real time as our customers around the world are running their operations. So maybe we can report on that data and, and provide some insight for, for people to use that would be beneficial as we go through this crisis. So after that conversation in mid-March, we actually built the COVID-19 Resource Center um, from uh, concept to uh, production. It was about four days. We actually got that out there. And basically the, the resource center is a series of, uh, of blogs and articles actually reporting on what is going on uh, in the area of manufacturing and the impact that COVID-19 is, is happening. And most of the blogs uh, are showing that impact graphically with various charts and graphs that I'm gonna share with you today. Now the question that we had to answer was, you know, we, since, since what we provide for manufacturers is so comprehensive, we have literally hundreds of metrics that our customers use that we could pull from to report on the impact of COVID-19. Um, and so this is just one example, uh, one screen of, of many, many that, that, we, that we considered and how, how can we use. But we wanted a metric, to, we wanted to report on a metric that was consistent across all different industries that we support and time zones and timeframes and locales. 
Um, and we wanted something that we could use that would be normative across the entire pandemic. And so we, we, we settled on something called production. And just briefly, let me explain what we mean by production. When someone is using the Plex software and uh, they are at a work center in the plant and they are making parts, they have a container there that fills up with parts. And when that container is full of parts, whether that's a, a box of chocolates or a, a metal bin of washers or maybe a pallet of boxes, when that fills up, there is a production record created either um, uh, automatically with a direct connection to the machine or through an operator who's standing there running the machine. And so they record that production and that production record has all the information about how much was made, when it was made and all of that information. But we didn't want to report on all of that because again, we get into different unit issues with our customers in various industries. So we're actually recording here the actual number of production records created. So every time a bin of material fills up with all of our customers around the world, it creates a production record. And that's what we decided to report on because it was consistent and normative across all of our different industries. And so you can see here, um, this is showing the first, uh, uh, the good times, as, as was said already by Lou, I believe, the first uh, two and a half months of this year. And we can see production is actually starting to, to uh, increase and go up, not only as Plex is growing, but also as, um, as our customer, uh, the economy is doing well and our customers are doing well. So you can see the production records actually starting to increase uh, over the first couple months of, of this year. But then we had uh, the catastrophic cliff. Starting in, in, in the, uh, March, we saw an 80% drop in production across our customer base in four weeks. This is like nothing. I've been in manufacturing for 30 years and I've never seen anything like this. I've been through so many recessions, even the Great Recession, the 2008, 2009, nothing like this. So our customers experienced a huge drop, a, a, a catastrophic drop in production, uh, as Chad said, so, such a huge drop in such a short time. And then that leveled out a little bit. You can see actually um, at the bottom there, it hit bottom and that coincided with uh, Easter actually, which is why it went that low. But then there was a, about a month where just some very basic essential manufacturing was going on, but for the most part, uh, making it through that trough was very difficult for our customer base as production had basically fallen off a cliff. But then we saw as things started to open up in May and in various locales around the world started to open up, we saw an increase that was started off gradual and then really took off in May and towards the end of May. And we actually have seen our customers recover about 75% of where they were um, uh, post uh, pandemic. So this is actually an encouraging chart for our customers as they are, are getting back online in the industries that they serve. Um, so this is one story I neglected to say, I wanted to say, briefly show you three stories. This is the first story, just showing worldwide production as a whole. Now we can slice and dice our data many different ways um, by country, by locale, by state, by industry. Um, and each country has a different story to tell. And so I was just gonna tell a story of one country and, and, and that is China. Um, very interesting graph here. You'll notice they had their, their catastrophic drop just like we did just a couple months, two and a half months before we did. Uh, they were only at the bottom of their trough for about a week or two and they started to recover. And their recover started, recovery started in February. So it was interesting as we were watching China start to recover, it was just at the time when we were starting to drop off the cliff here in the United States and the rest of the world. But we were looking to China as a model for perhaps how we could recover as well. So we were using China as a model and it was interesting to see them continue to increase. But then you'll notice something happens here, which is really fascinating. Um, there's a national ho holiday there at the beginning of um, May um, uh, for that accounting for that dip. But their recovery has stalled at about 50%. So you look back at my previous chart with the worldwide production showing we're 75, almost 80% back worldwide production, but the China levels for our customer base is at 50%. And I think what we're seeing here is actually a, a um, indicative of what our customers are telling us and is that they're using this time to um, reconsider the supply chain, uh, reduce their dependencies, bring things back uh, uh, on shore, bring things back closer to their facilities. And that's, I think, what we're seeing right here. And actually, you see the last six weeks or so, production in China has actually decreased from, from their high there in, in, in mid-May. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to plow through this. That was a quote from uh, Kearney about uh, reshoring. The last story I want to quickly tell is, is based on industry, and and what we're and I'm going to look at we're going to look at the data a little bit differently here. And 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 what you're seeing here is just a, a cross section from a much bit bigger graph. And each orange blue bar pair is one Plex customer. 
The orange bar shows what their average weekly production was pre-COVID-19. And the blue bar shows what their production was for the week that you see there, April 27th, which is right in the bottom of that trough. All right, so you can see for automotive, our automotive customers, they were practically um, just obliterated, except for a couple of exceptions, uh, customers that are supporting the trucking industry and other industries that were still um, uh, going. For the most part, automotive was just obliterated there in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the pandemic. But then you can see what happened. This is the same graph, same customers uh, production uh, uh, from last week. And you see how most of them are back to their, uh, almost to their pre-COVID-19 levels. And some of them are going like gangbusters trying to make up for last time. And then I want to com compare that briefly to food and beverage. This is the same type of ch chart for our food and beverage customers, but this is also in the middle of the pandemic, but you'll notice something very different from automotive. As opposed to automotive where there was hardly any blue in the middle of the pandemic, you can see here for food and beverage customers, a lot of them are doing quite well. And that's our customers that were supporting um, uh, grocery and grocery stores. We had customers talking about in the space of a week or two, they had orders that were quadruple, the same orders from the previous year. And they're like, how do we handle that? And then you have some other customers in food and beverage that were still producing, but not near as much, still struggling. And these are customers that were supporting the restaurant industry. And of course, this is the same chart now, uh, food and beverage uh, comparing to last week where most of them are, are just flying, <laughs> flying off the shelves. Um, and, and you can see most of them are actually um, sometimes double of their production from, from pre-COVID-19. So that's, I, I blew through that. That's uh, uh, the, the, the data that we've been providing. And, and uh, I won't go through the use cases, very similar to what Lou said, just helping to provide a data-based view on what is happening, uh, giving information for analysts and the press to use in their reporting, and then helping our customers to, uh, to, to really decide and, and look at how to forecast and how to respond. Uh, respond. So um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, go to plex.com and you don't have to remember that uh, uh, URL for the resource center. If you go to plex.com, there's a link on there for the re resource center. Whew. All right, there you go. All right, Jerry, that was awesome. We're so glad to have you. We've been, uh, try we've been uh, trying to wrangle you in for one of these for a little bit now, uh, mostly through brute force and LinkedIn messages. So I'm thankful that you uh, were willing to, uh, to, to get through the spam and see me uh, somewhere in there. Uh, that was awesome. Really, everybody did such a great job. Um, uh, and just for our, uh, we still have over 200 people here. Um, and, you know, so we're moving into the discussion phase. Uh, our, our, um, our panelists, um, are not required, but um, have been nice enough to extend this conversation a little bit. If anyone does need to log off on the panelist side, uh, we, we totally respect that and, and we'll stick around as long as we can uh, to answer questions. But in the meantime, just to, to kick things off, uh, you know, starting, starting with Chad, uh, you know, and then I'll, I'll kind of move around. Uh, you know, how has COVID-19 changed you know, the future of the manufacturing economy? Sorry, what did you ask me? My son just walked in. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, uh, you know, one of our first questions that we've had is, you know, how will COVID-19 change the future of the manufacturing economy? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we're continuing to hear, and, and you heard this from Jerry a second ago as well, <clears throat> is that people are reevaluating their supply chains, right? So we, if people are looking at, you know, maybe not producing it elsewhere, maybe making it here, right? So everyone is having that conversation. Uh, number one, I think we were already starting to have that conversation because of the trade war last year, but this has exacerbated that conversation pretty, pretty significantly. Uh, and then you, you add to that, uh, you know, maybe needing to have more than one, one supplier. I think the other thing that is going to change is that you're going to, we're already hearing people talking about re-engineering their production process, right? Certainly with social distancing in mind, or maybe even like us working remotely where possible. And that's not always possible on the shop floor, but we actually had th uh, three quarters of our members in our last survey say, that, that where, where possible, uh, there we're going to see where things could be done remotely. Now, that, again, that's, that's an amazing statistic given that we're talking about manufacturers, and maybe it's talking more about the white collar jobs, but, but it is a sense, I think, that people are definitely uh, rethinking the manufacturing process wherever possible. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and you know, I think, uh, you know, to that extent, right, you're seeing companies, uh, you know, more than ever, right, starting to leverage data right, to start driving those opportunities. Uh, Jerry, uh, what's at stake when companies don't look at data? 
kind of liken it to driving a car with the windshield blacked out and the rear window blacked out. You only have the side window. So you could probably kind of get to where you're going maybe, but man, you can't plan for what's coming. If something jumps out in front of you, you're kind of screwed. You don't know where you came from. So you can kind of limp along, but if you want to be efficient, if you want to actually um, get to where you're going in, in a way that uh, uh, improves your gross margins, improves your efficiency, and, and returns uh, value to your shareholders and to your employees, You've got to have analytics, you've got to have data, you've got to have that insight that's gonna give you the tools you need to be successful. Yeah, you know, we're hearing a lot about uh, changes in supply chain in particular, right? And, and, and you know, with that comes, you know, uh, uh, visibility uh, into, uh, you know, what's coming, what, what's happened, how you can improve. Uh, Lou, uh, question for you. Uh, you know, as, as people are moving more remotely, right? And, and working uh, in a more remote capacity, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that they struggle with is is machine, you know, you know, machines going down, right? Uh, what are some use cases that you're seeing impact the shop floor, uh, the you know, uh, that that are helping companies move, you know, remote? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so, I obviously the the obvious one is, you know, if if you can monitor your machines with some sort of software remotely, uh, you can sit on your couch at home and see when your machine goes down, so you don't have to. You know, be in the factory all the time, you know, you don't have to endanger people by packing a whole bunch of uh, employees in. Um, you can just say, well, I'm only going to go in if this uh, manufacturing process messes up. And so that's, um, I think that's one of the most obvious things. Uh, the, the second, and, and as you know, Graham, what we're working on here is um, one of our kind of moonshot projects is to really enable the automated factory of the future. So um, what we're working on here are, you know, things where you can not just read data from your machines, but you can actually control your machines remotely. Um, we recently had a, a very interesting pilot where uh, we basically stopped a machine before it failed. And, you know, the, the, the logical extension of that is that um, why not just stop a machine? Why not tell it to go? Why not tell it to move in a certain way? Why not load a G-code program on it remotely? Uh, there's a whole lot of possibilities with this. And I think, um, at least for, for, for us, we see a lot of opportunity to enable just remote factory control. Um, and that's uh, kind of been catalyzed by the coronavirus. Yeah, what about yeah, I was gonna pass it right to you, Jerry. <laughs> and Lou is so right. And the foundation of what he's talking about is, is actually having a system that runs in the cloud. And I know we're at a point where some of us technologists take this for granted, but I also know how manufacturers are a little bit more old school. And, and for those of you who are listening that haven't made the move to the cloud, I can't encourage you enough. This is how you, um, how, it's one of the biggest components to helping you survive a scenario like this. We had so many of our, cust uh, so many of our customers who, who run Plex in the cloud and also run uh, uh, maybe a, a, a competitive, competitor ERP to roll up financials. Uh, and they talked about the difference between uh, their, their companies and their plants running Plex when this hit, being able to see what was going on, like, like Lou said, just understanding around the world what was going on versus uh, some of them that were running our competitor. I won't name them three letters from Germany. They had a really hard time trying to figure out what was going on and what was happening in their plants because it was all on-premise. So I just want to put a plug in for the cloud for you guys who are, are considering that. This, this is the time and, and uh, it'll really help with these sorts of situations. I love that comment, Jerry. And you know, I think uh, in some ways we're uh, lightly alluding to one of my favorite topics lately, which is the democratization of manufacturing data. Um, you know, and you know, the, it, you know, in previous eras that that data was really locked, you know, siloed, you know, in individual areas, whether it's, you know, for the data scientist or, you know, for procurement, right, or, uh, but, but today, right, with these, these cloud-based systems, uh, you can uh, really build an aligned ecosystem of value where data can seamlessly flow from one system to another and, and drive unique value, uh, and even more so use cases for every person within the organization. And I think what's cool about today's presentation is, uh, Oftentimes when you think about manufacturing analytics, you're very much focused on the, on the shop floor and at the application level. But I think um, in some ways what all three of our presenters were able to show is that uh, the value extends greater than just, um, you know, on stopping a machine, right, or managing your procurement or your supply chain, uh, but actually can help your company uh, in, uh, when it comes to a larger aggregate see a bigger picture and make large business decisions based on on, on large uh, groups of data. So I find that particularly 
interesting insight that I've gained from all this. Um, yeah, uh, one kind of question uh, before uh, before I uh, let everybody go. Uh, this this moment, in I feel like, really reminds us how we're all connected. You know, like never before. Uh, how is this crisis, you know, bringing you know your individual communities together? Uh, and I'll start kind of with with Chad and you know Jerry and then Lou, and then uh, we can. Let all these attendees go. We still have well over 100 people uh, with us. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. So I guess I'll start with the broader manufacturing community, since we represent manufacturers in the U.S., right? And, and, and I think the first thing, and you heard uh, Lou talk about it earlier, is that manufacturers have really tried to step up and be part of the solution, right? So whether that was changing what they were making and making ventilators or masks or whatever else, um, we, we had a lot of our members who were coming forward and saying, I have excess capacity, I can make X, and they did it, right? <clears throat> and certainly on the vaccine side, you're having the pharmaceutical industry really, you know, trying to really go out there and aggressively try to find, find a cure. So I think being the solution is part of it. Uh, I think the other part of it, and, and actually what brought the NAM together with both Plex and Machine Metrics, uh, is also something that Lou mentioned earlier, and that is that we don't have a lot of data, right? As an economist, as a chief economist, uh, the dearth of data that's out there, I think, is something that let, brought all of us together to be able to try to capture what's really happening in the manufacturing sector, especially when those publicly available data sources kind of, uh, we're not quite there yet. Hmm. Exactly. What about you, Jerry? Yeah, I would, I would add to that, just even just watching our customers, uh, many of them doing, you know, what, what Chad was talking about, but even helping each other, some of them even competitors, you know, especially when it came time to bring their workers back. This is uncharted waters, trying to, to get their workers back on the line and do so safely, um, honor you know, government uh, restrictions or um, orders and trying to manage all that. This is a big task. And watching them and in our community, when we have provide forums for our customers to get together and talk and chat and watching them help each other and, and provide documents to each other and ask and answer each other questions. And, and we had one customer that built a, a screen with our, our internal screen builder for our application. And they shared that with the rest of the cu customers on a, on a survey that you would ask your, your employees when they came back to work. And so just watching them come together uh, and figure out how to get things back going again was, was really cool to watch and, and kind of just uh, be a part of. That's awesome. Yeah, so um, I guess the, my, my answer is going to be two, twofold. So the first pertains specifically to manufacturing, which is, you know, echoing what everyone else has said. Like, our customers have literally come to us and been like, well, you guys see best practice manufacturing across people who usually produce ventilators. You know, tell us more about what, what, what they're doing. You know, can, we, can, can you put us in touch with them? And I think that's a real way for... Uh, the community come together and you know help get us out of this crisis um, you know manufacturing is the genesis of all physical goods that you see uh, anything that's not you know natural or you know organic basically uh, manufacturing makes it so manufacturing is going to get us out of this uh, manufacturing is going to be able to make all the parts that are going to enable us to emerge from this pandemic uh, through technology through um, you know building the tools that um, and the 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 structures, the, the goods that are going to help bring us uh, uh, out of this, um, this debacle that, that we're all in. And then second, um, you know, the wider community as a whole, uh, what I see is that, um, you know, we're, we're fighting an invisible foe. You know, it's not like it's World War III and we're, you know, at war with like Russia and, and you know, other economies and things like that. This is very different. We're, we're fighting something that we can't see. And because of that, that has really created um, uh, good things and bad things. So, so the good things are that I see a lot of people doing more work uh, for, for, for pro bono, frankly. You know, it's, it's not like people are just charging as much as they can to get as much um, utility for themselves and as much profit. I think there's a lot more charity coming through now. Um, and um, that's a really great thing. I, I think as a society, we need to especially with everything that's going on, kind of learn to be a bit more compassionate and kind of you know, come together and realize that we don't want um, you know, this post-apocalyptic capitalism that sets in. And you know, uh, I think a lot of authors have, have uh, were told this and we all don't want that. And the way we don't get there is by changing our mindsets and by really cultivating this culture of, 
uh, understanding and, and empathy and, and, and compassion. Um, I think, you know, it's not all, it's not all roses, obviously. I, I think, obviously, um, whenever people are under duress, and uh, this situation has certainly created duress, um, it creates things like anxiety, and it creates uh, a lot of, um, you know, there are say mental health issues, and and I see that uh, kind of cropping up more and more, and um, that's also a conversation that I think needs to be surfaced. Um, I think it's uh, as part of a, an ultra capitalistic economy. Sometimes we we sometimes suppress that, and I think if we really want to come together as a community and really try and um, I guess you know be competitive in the 21st century. One of the things we need to start embracing is uh, an attitude of, of more compassion and, and of more empathy. Um, so, you know, all these things, all these things are, are coming to play. And, and I think this pandemic has really accelerated a lot of these trends. I think it would have gone this way eventually anyways, um, you know, maybe in another 10, 20, 30 years. But all these problems uh, are kind of servicing ahead of time because of that. Um, so that's, that's kind of my take on this whole situation. Wow, thanks, Lou. That was that was really cool. Um, I appreciate the multi-layer uh, response. And yeah, I think one thing is for, for certain, right? Um, uh, I I think that you know we can all be more well informed uh, by 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 coming together and sharing data like we did today. Um, and and I think that you know in doing so, uh, companies you know like Plex, Machine Metrics, Nam, we um, we have an obligation in times like this to to support our communities and provide. Uh, anything that we can, right, to help um, our industry uh, drive forward. So, um, so I just want to thank uh, Jerry and Chad and Lou for the amazing time. What a what an incredible uh, webinar! Uh, over a hundred people still here, even ten minutes late. Uh, you know, about three hundred at our highest point. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we look forward to our next in the series, um, and uh, you know, we wish everyone a safe uh, and successful. Uh, you know, uh, coming months. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.